Good morning, Hillside. How are we doing today? My name is Ben. I'm going to be giving the morning announcements to get started today. Um, we're going to talk first about our yard work ministry. So for any of those who might be interested in getting involved here at Hillside, you can speak with Philip. We're looking for a yard work team. Um, I don't know if we have a lot of volunteers at this time, so that's an area of need uh, here in the church. So if you're looking, please consider the yard work ministry team. We are going to be having, having a uh, worship night here at the church, and that's on July the 9th. And that's going to be a special evening here. It's from 7 o'clock to 9 o'clock. And we're just going to be coming together as a church. We're going to be reading scripture, praying together. Um, and it's going to be something that's really special. And I think it's our first one. So if you're interested, please come out with us on July the 9th for worship night. Um, there's one other thing before we go to the online giving that we'll go over, and that is our Wednesday night Bible study. So if you've ever considered being part of a Bible study or if you're looking for one, this is a Bible study that I strongly encourage you to be a part of. Uh, from personal experience, um, just the lessons that I've learned being with David and Michelle in their home, um, it's just very helpful and very eye-opening on a lot of areas that I didn't realize or know about. And we're currently going over progressive Christianity, and it's just something that I probably would have walked right into myself and not even realized what I was doing. So there's a lot of value there in that class, and I, I say that, like I said, from my personal experience. So if you're looking for something, um, please, by all means, come and join us. It's uh, bi-weekly. It's every other Wednesday night, and the next one, I believe, will be July the, this Wednesday, not, this Wednesday June the 30th. Um, and then, you know, we all go through stressful times, and, and we have a lot going on through the week where we just kind of need a break. So if on that Wednesday night, if you happen to be looking for just some downtime and, and maybe a nap, Stephen does occasionally teach the lesson. So... <laughs> I'll, I'll let you know um, when he's going to be leading the lesson. That night. <laughs> and then finally, uh, for giving, there's a couple different ways that you can give or, or contribute to Hillside Church. First and foremost, the Faith Life app. Um, that's what I use on my phone. And there's a lot of bulletins. There's a lot of communication, a lot of back and forth there. There's a lot of uh, helpful tips there, too. So the Faith Life app is probably the easiest way of giving. But then we also have our website, which is hillsidechurchtn.org, if you want to go to the website and give, or you can give right over here in this box. Um, or, as, this or this one. There's two. There's two boxes. Either one you prefer. Sandra really likes this one, so maybe that's special. But um, I think that's got us for the announcements. We're going to um, get into prayer, and then we'll start our worship service with David. So would you please pray with me? Our most gracious and heavenly Father, we come to you today to give thanks for the many blessings that you have given us. Good Lord, we pray for David as he, give to, as he gives today's lesson. Uh, we play, pray for your provisions that you watch over us and protect us, good Lord. We pray for your guidance and for us to trust in your guidance. May we have the ability to open our hearts and our eyes so we may see who you are calling us to God toward you. May we all be good examples throughout this next week so others can see your light through us. Father, we pray for those who are facing struggles. We pray over the well, the unwell, for those who are sick, maybe they're lost, and anyone who is suffering, for we know that suffering is a way for us to be closer to you, Father. Please wrap your arms around us all and renew all of our strength, and may we all remember what your armor consists of. Good Lord, we pray for the people here of this church. We feel your presence here at Hillside, and we are so grateful and excited to worship you. We pray for the children of the church and the ministry here, good Lord, and that you can watch over us and, and help us to lead them to ensure they are, are led to you. Good Lord, please lead God and direct us in a way that is pleasing unto thee. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, for we know that he is the way, the truth, and the life. We ask all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 
before we sing this next song, I thought we should read the scripture that goes along with it, just as a reminder, kind of to prepare our hearts for it. So we're going to see, uh, read Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I lack. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He renews my life. He leads me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even when I go through the darkest valley, I fear no danger, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Only goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord as long as I live. Amen. Thank you. 
Jesus died my soul to save, my lips shall still repeat, cause Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe, sin hath left a crimson stain. that you did pay a debt for us, that we were guilty and living in sin, Father, but you sent your son to die for us so that we could be washed clean and pure, Father, so that we could have hope eternal with you. And thank you so much for just today and just the, the honor and privilege to sing praises to you with every breath in our lung, with every beat of our heart, Father. We just we want to honor you and praise you with our lives, Father, and all that we say and do. Thank you so much for just the freedom we have in that. And Father, be with David as he brings today's sermon, the one that you've laid on his heart, Father. I just pray that you use him in a mighty way to just to touch our hearts and, and draw us closer to you so that we can be lights in our community, Father, so that we can be hope for others, Father, and, and that we can be good stewards of and ambassadors of your kingdom father so that we can advance your name and make you known and, and draw others into your salvation father thank you for everyone here father i pray that you just um help us to just set aside whatever distractions or, or worries we may have so that we can be fully attentive to what you have for us today we love you and we ask all these things in your son's holy and precious name and jesus name amen How's everybody doing? Good? Guys, we're working on the air conditioning, I promise. It's going to be a little bit cooler. Y'all overload the air conditioning, but that's okay. It's a good problem to have, right? Um, that being said, uh, two things. One, I, I wanted to ask a favor if there's anybody out here. We have a desperate need to remove the, the tubs in the children's ministry, and I've never cut up a tub before and take it apart and caused havoc. So, if any of you have experienced that, I know some of the elders are going to try to help me with this, but 
I want to take a couple of sawzalls and, and we're going to, we actually have new flooring for the kids. We just need to get the tubs out of the way so that we can put the flooring in. That carpet's been there forever and, and we clean it as much as we can, but we still don't know exactly what's in it. So if you love your children, come help me. Uh, <laughs> man, that is not pressure at all, right? Uh, second one is actually, uh, last week when the elders spoke, I actually got to go hang out with the kids in I had a blast. My kids are grown, and so we went over there. I went over there, and um, as I was leaving, um, I was called back, and Laura had all the kids do their memory verses for me, and it was just fantastic. So uh, just, I know she can't hear me. She may hear me later, but thank you, Laura, for all you do. It was, it was just great to hear all these verses, and the kids, man, they were excited you don't mess with them in their verses. You just have to get out of the way. And so uh, that was me. So um, I, I, I'm glad to be back this week. If you have your Bibles, go to Acts chapter 6. Um, your Bible apps probably won't work out here, so we have to bring books. But pray, we're on, we're on the list to get internet at some point. I told Ben it was my secret ploy to keep your phones from going off while I teach. And... Uh, so we've got a little bit of a lesson today. It's going to be a little bit longer than normal, but not much longer. I promise you I will get you out for lunch and not dinner. It'll be great. Uh, we are going to go through the life of Stephen in the book of Acts today. And uh, Stephen's life is, in a sense, it's a model of the Christian life. We understand what, what he goes through and, and how he lives. And what I want to do is um, I want to walk through his whole story in one setting and so with that, I'm going to tell you a quick story and kind of get us uh, where I want us to go when it comes to, to, to Stephen and his life. Um, there was a pastor. He actually wrote this story down after it happened. It actually happened in 1961. And this is what he says. He says, on a cold night in 1961, I said goodbye to my soon-to-be bride and pointed my Ford on the familiar path home. As might be suspected, I was in good spirits but then a convulsing body in my headlights sprawled across the gutter and curb. Ended my moment. What is it? Was it a seizure? Was it a hit and run? A mugging or maybe a, a would-be mugger feigned distress? What should I do? His adrenaline was surging and he sped around the corner to a store and he jumped out of his car and he ran into the store to call an ambulance. And suddenly, gazing through some, some smoke, he realized that he was looking at the business end of a 38 revolver in the hands of a pale, wide-eyed teenage employee of this store of holiday liquor. Instinctively, the, the, he sputtered something to the, the man. He said, don't shoot, a man's lying in the street. To which the boy replied with a surreal calm, and he said, good, I got him. And as we stood there, an incredible picture loomed through the smoke that behind the counter stood two middle-aged clerks, their white shirts growing increasingly red with blood. The tiny holes in the larger man's glasses revealed that they had been blasted with a sawed-off shotgun. We all have memories of experiences when it seems like that time stood still. And that is, he, the pastor says, that is how that day is for me. He remembered gaping holes in the store windows, uh, waddling from expended shotgun shells, broken bottles pouring forth their content. He remembered liquor mixing with blood on the tan asphalt tile. Two bloody clerks standing motionless in disbelief, the blonde teenage stock boy putting the, the revolver up to the pastor's face. The five evenly spaced holes that looked like cherry pits just above the man's kidneys. Most of all, he remembered the bitter moaning of the dying young man in the street. On the verge of eternity, his lips poured forth the fullness of his heart, a litany, a, a litany of curses and hatred. At death, he was miserably estranged from both men and God. And I tell you the story because simply this, the thing about death is that it reveals who we really are. We can fake it in the midst of our lives, but death will reveal who we really are. The famous, the famous French uh, philosopher Voltaire, he hated Christianity. He said of Jesus, he said, curse the wretch. 
he made this boast. This, he was, he was a, a philosopher and he would write uh, thousands and thousands of, of papers. And he said, in 20 years, Christianity will be no more and my single hand shall destroy the edifice it took 12 apostles to rear. He was proud. He was confident. He was cynical. His death is disputed, but here's what we do know, that on his deathbed, his, his doctor testified to these words by Voltaire. And this man who was uh, anti-Christian, against Christ, on his beth- deathbed, he says, I am abandoned by God. I'm abandoned by man. He looks at his doctor and he says, I'll give you half of what I'm worth if you will give me six months life. Then I shall go to hell and you go with me. Oh Christ. Oh Jesus Christ. Oddly enough, Voltaire, the philosopher who wrote so much against Christianity, in August of 1836, 58 years after his death, he would have been shocked to see that his residence was used as a place for Bibles uh, to be printed and for religious tracts to be printed. For others, death is different. Death reveals beauty. For example, John Wesley, he he died in 1791 and in giving counsel and exhortations and praise for God, his final words are, are, are the same sentence three times. The best of all, God is with us. The best of all, God is with us. The best of all, God is with us. Farewell. Adoniram Judson, he was an American missionary to Burma. This is in in the 1850s. And while he was on his deathbed, he said, I go with the gladness of a boy bounding away from school. I feel so strong in Christ. Those were his final words. And finally, Jonathan Edwards, just one last one. He was dying from smallpox in 1758. He gave final directions. He said goodbye to his daughter. And while dying in peace, the smile on his face, he says, where is Jesus, my never failing friend? You see, we're going to do a bit of reading today. We are going to read of the final day of a man named Stephen who was full of faith and lived a life not his own, but a life that belonged to God. The interesting thing is that we will will have all all of us, like Stephen today, will have our final words to say, our final words to our kids, our final words about life and our world. But Stephen, he is a picture of an authentic Christian life. How we live our life matters. Who or what we depend on matters, and the legacy we leave for others matters. And see, we live in a generation that's living with a me first, live in the moment, life is short mentality, and that type of mentality will never understand what it means to live for eternity. To be honest, some Christians don't live for eternity. We want eternity, but it doesn't mean we actually want to live for it. Stephen's life is a testimony of a person who lived for Christ and died in Christ. Today, in a sense, even though this happened thousands of years ago, today is his eulogy for all of us to to be witnesses to his life. And he beckons all of us to this brave faith, a brave belief. And with that, I promise we have a lot of reading, but I'm going to make it quick. But I want us to hear his story, and I want us to hear his words. So we're going to start in verse 8 in the book of Acts, and and we'll finish uh, chapter 6. Verse 8 of chapter 6 through 15. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians and, and of the Alexandrians, all of those from... Cilicia and Asia rose up and disputed with Stephen, but they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Then they secretly instigated men who said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and seized him and brought him before the council. 
And they set up false witnesses who said, This man never ceases to speak words against his holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. So Stephen, he lives a life prepared. He lives a life prepared and and he's ready for his faith to be tested. There is a picture of the Christian life in the life of Stephen, that Stephen lives a life ready. He doesn't know what's going to happen tomorrow. He doesn't even know what's going to happen today. So he lives ready for what God has for him. Sometimes as modern Christians, we, we're, not surely, we're not sure why we attend church, why we read our scripture. We don't imagine that there is going to be prep, we're preparing for anything. We think that everything is going to be good and peacefully we will go to, uh, to, to eternity. But we don't live in preparation like we should. We go to church sometimes because our parents did. That's what I did for decades. Or it's the thing to do. You know, the purpose in coming is that you would, you would grow and you would prepare yourself for these moments that God is going to give you to bring him glory. It could be the end of your life. It could be at the beginning of your life. It could be at the beginning of your Christian walk. You just don't know. So we sometimes don't take this seriously. And when calamity comes, we're not ready. We're not ready for it. It's heartbreaking for me. Life is going to get us at some point. It's going to be a divorce. It'll be sickness, loss, an opportunity to share the gospel, an opportunity to stand for the gospel. And because we don't know what we, why we're doing this, we don't get ready for what's coming. We don't imagine every peaceful day God gives us is a day of preparation. We don't look at life that way. So in other words, when the time comes, you're going to stand in what you have or you're going to fall in what you lack. One or the other will happen. And it's a scary thing. We gather together in community studying scripture to be ready as we mature and as we grow in faith. You never know when your moment's going to come where you can bring God glory. You know what's interesting is I've done funerals for people who knew Christ and who didn't know Christ. And those have always been the most eye-opening things for me, the amount of hope in a very difficult day versus amount of hopelessness in a very difficult day. And and when I started to do funerals, I didn't go, man, I bet I see this. I saw it in ways that I would would never, could have ever guessed of the hope that I would see. I remember one man, he passed away, and you would have thought, you would have thought he did something incredible because it was a celebration. And I would argue he did do something incredible. He kept his faith. But we don't always remember. I I remember I had a neighbor who passed away and Michelle and I left there heartbroken because it felt so hopeless. But we don't think about stuff like this. We never know when our moment will come when we will bring God glory the man who I was so excited for that day when he passed, God was glorified in ways that I was just overwhelmed at how much God had received glory from this man's funeral, from this man's life. So this passage, it talks about grace. There's something deeper than blessing and receiving grace. So it says Stephen is full of grace and power and grace is something active within the life of a believer. That to receive grace means that you would be full of grace and filled to the full with grace. That in receiving grace, we offer grace to others. It is so overflowing within us, we have to share the grace given to us. Scholars see grace in this sense as unmerited, unlimited riches of God poured on us through Christ. And that pouring continues through our life to other people. How can we live full of grace if we don't forgive others? If we don't intentionally give them what they don't deserve? That's hard. That sounds really good when a pastor says it on a Sunday. 
But to give people grace that they don't deserve, that usually means you have to suffer something. Because what you want to do is you want to give them what they do deserve. But because we're so full of grace that we understand what God has forgiven us of, we freely offer that forgiveness. Stephen stands out because he offers to people more than what they are. Just as God grants grace as a gift to Stephen more than we ever deserved. We are so quick to judge and criticize rather than being full of grace. My experience in the church, even growing up, was we were more judgmental than we were ever in the the area of offering grace to someone. But you see with this, Stephen's life is this reminder that to be full of grace, that means you are going to share something that God has given to you to the people around you. Gosh, it is so easy to criticize. It is so easy to find something wrong with something. It is easy. It takes much more to offer his grace instead. It takes much more. So Stephen, he's falsely accused by a specific synagogue, the synagogue of the freedmen. It was actually Paul's synagogue, oddly enough, and we're going to get more into that in the weeks ahead. It was made up of Hellenistic Jews from Alexandria, And they had this Greek influence, so they would debate religious issues. Greeks were very famous for debating knowledge together. And it was a common tactic also of the Jews that it's exactly what they did to Jesus. They accused Jesus of blasphemy just as they accused uh, Stephen of, of blasphemy here. And even to Stephen's death, they follow the same method that they used to kill Jesus. But the thing is, Stephen doesn't care. Stephen is ready for his moment to give God glory. Scholars believe from the very beginning of his arrest, Stephen probably already knew that he was going to die. That he wasn't looking for a way out when he was arrested. So prior to this moment, Stephen lives out a visible faith to all of those around him. Even in the accusations, these men had to confront Stephen's faith. And what we see in the scripture is that they cannot They can't find the words to argue with his faith. And those who love Stephen saw the Spirit of God within him, overflowing in grace to others, demonstrating and speaking of the power of God. And this is crazy. This is what got him in trouble with the religious people. Right? He's like, he's so full of the Spirit, he gets arrested. Man, man. Poor guy, right? (laughs) But Jesus warned all his disciples that this was going to happen, that they were going to face opposition, that they were going to face death. So the dichotomy here is false witnesses tell lies. Stephen commits to speaking the truth. It's interesting that the temple now practices this pattern of bearing false witness for the sake of religious preservation. And at the same time, Stephen is willing to lose everything for one moment to share the gospel. So the scripture gives us this picture that Stephen stands before liars and zealots, shining like an angel. I want to be clear here. People and angel are two different things. Oftentimes I hear, especially at at funerals, heaven gained another angel. They didn't. When someone dies, it's not true. Paul makes a very clear distinction between heaven, I mean, between people and angels. But we share one thing in common with angels and probably a few others. The word angel in and of itself in scripture, it means messenger. And in this moment, Stephen has a message. There's another thing we share, that when scripture says that Stephen has the face of an angel, it has much to do with presence. More than likely, when it, when it comes to angels, angels glow because they are in the presence of God. And, and Stephen's face is shining because there's this commonality that Stephen's experienced the presence of God. And, and, and Moses had this. He would go up on the mountain in the presence of God and he would come back glowing. And it freaked people out, so Moses had to cover his face. And, and I always laugh at this because... Everybody was scared of glowing the dark Moses, so Moses had to cover up. But when it's said and done, Stephen's glowing like an angel because 
he has the presence of God among him, on him. And it's so ironic that Stephen has a face like an angel is more like Mo- and is more like Moses in this moment than those accusing him of speaking against Moses. To have a face of an angel is to have a face of the one who has been in God's presence. And it's with this kind of power Stephen is about to speak. Okay, are you comfortable? Everybody relaxed? This is the big chunk of reading. We're going to get through it. Make sure, you know, everything's awake. 1 through 53, I've timed it. It takes me four minutes, so we're going to do this, okay? All right. Verse 1 through 53. Verse 1 says this. And the high priest said, Are these things so? And Stephen said, Brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. And said to him, go out from your land and from your kindred and go into the land that I will show you. Then he went out from the land of the Chaldeans and lived in Haran. And after his father died, God, God removed him from there into this land in which you are now living. Yet he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot's length, but promised to give it to him as a possession. And to his offspring after him, though he had no child, And God spoke to this effect that his offspring would be sojourners in a land belonging to others who would enslave them and afflict them 400 years. But I will judge the nations that they serve, said God. And after that, they shall come out and worship me in this place. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac became the father of Jacob and Jacob of the twelve patriarchs. And the patriarchs, jealous of Joseph, sold him into Egypt, but God was with him and rescued him out of all his afflictions and gave him favor and wisdom before Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who made him ruler over Egypt and over all his household. Now there came a famine throughout all Egypt and Canaan and great affliction, and our fathers could find no food. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out our fathers on their first visit. And on the second visit, Joseph made him known to his brothers. And Joseph's family became known to Pharaoh. And Joseph sent and summoned Jacob his father and all his kindred, 75 persons in all. And Jacob went down into Egypt, and he died, he and our fathers. And they were carried back to Shechem and laid in the tomb that Abraham had bought for a sum of silver for the sons of Hamor and Shechem. But as the time of the promise drew near, which God had granted to Abraham, the people increased and multiplied in Egypt until there arose over Egypt another king who did not know Joseph. He dealt shrewdly with our race and forced our fathers to expose their infants so that they would not be kept alive. At this time, Moses was born and he was beautiful in God's sight. And he was brought up for three months in his father's house. And when he was exposed, Pharaoh's daughter adopted him and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in his words and deeds. When he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them being wronged, he defended the oppressed man and avenged him by striking down the Egyptian. He supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they did not understand. And on the following day, he appeared to them as they were quarreling and tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brothers. Why do you wrong each other? But the man who was wronging his neighbor thrust him aside, saying, Who made you a ruler and judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? At this retort, Moses fled and became an exile in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. Deep breath, verse 30. Now when 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai, in a flame of fire in a bush. When Moses saw it, he was amazed at the sight, and as he drew near to look, there came the voice of the Lord. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Ham, and of Isaac, and of Jacob. And Moses trembled and did not dare to look. Then the Lord said to him, Take off the sandals from your feet, 
for the place where you're standing is holy ground. I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their groaning and I have come down to deliver them and now come, I will send you to Egypt. This Moses whom they rejected saying, who made you a ruler and judge? This man God sent as both ruler and redeemer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. This man led them out performing wonders and signs in Egypt and at the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. This is the Moses who said to the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him at Mount Sinai and with our fathers. He received living oracles to to give to us. Our fathers refused to obey him, but thrust him aside, and in their hearts they turned to Egypt, saying to Aaron, Make for us gods who will go before us. And for this Moses who led us out from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days and offered a sacrifice to the idol and were rejoicing in the works of their hands. But God turned away and gave them over to worship the host of heaven as it is written in the book of the prophets. Do you bring to me slain beasts and sacrifices during the 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You took up the tent of Moloch and the star of your god Rephraim, the images that you made to worship, and I will send you into exile beyond Babylon. Our fathers had the tent of witness in the wilderness, just as he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it, according to the pattern that he had seen. Our fathers, in turn, brought it in with Joshua when they dispossessed the nations that God drove out before our fathers. So it was until the days of David who found favor in the sight of God and asked him to find a a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built a house for him. Yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made by hands, as the prophet says. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Did not my hand make all these things? You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit, as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered, who you received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. Everybody awake. We made it. It was a long reading, but there's a reason to cover this together. So Stephen, what he does in this, he addresses uh, three sacred cows in Israel. And, And these are ones that we should be aware of. This is the longest presentation given in Acts, and there's a lot to process. I'm going to keep it at a high level to make it easy to understand why they killed Stephen for this speech. It wasn't just the end of his speech where he becomes prophetic. We'll talk about that in a second. But there's three sacred cows that that Stephen basically addresses here. The first thing that they held in idolatry was land. That the Jews believed that God gave privileges for those who lived in Palestine. As long as they were in this specific place, they were okay. And Stephen refutes this by telling them that Abraham was outside of Palestine when he was blessed. He was outside of Israel when he was blessed. Abraham doesn't gain an inch of the Holy Land. Joseph is blessed in Egypt. The land is not the blessing. That despite the, the, the sacred cow here, Stephen is saying, your land is not the blessing. The second one was law. That the Jews believed that God gave blessing to those that were only in the law. And so Stephen refutes this by quoting Moses in Deuteronomy 18. He says, God would raise up for the Jews a prophet like Moses from God's people. And rather than, than being a, about the law, the law points people to Christ. It's not the law that saves you. And then the third sacred cow is the temple, that the Jews followed an Old Testament mindset that if the temple existed, 
that it was, it was evidence of their faithfulness. And Stephen refutes this as well, and he quotes Isaiah 66 in this long passage, and he declares that heaven is God's throne and the earth is his footstool, not the temple. And on the cross, the veil is torn, and God now lives in the temple of people, not buildings. And unfortunately, it's very possible that we hold these three sacred cows today. In regards to land, all right, before I say this, I'm a veteran saying this. I am not anti-American. I love my country. But in regards to land, certainly God has blessed this country. But we are not the only country God has blessed. What is a country when its inhabitants are suffering from sin? Right? It's hard. God blesses obedience before he does nationality. We've got to understand that. America was founded on, on Christian principles and ideals. And, and if you go back historically, to, despite what um, liberal scholars say today, there's a lot of evidence that, that there was a, a, a Christian ideal when this nation was formed. But what is nationality without obedience? Sometimes we can hold to that sacred cow. Doesn't mean we let this country go. In fact, we should fight for it. Biblically, in prayer, full of grace, sharing the gospel. The greatest cringe moment for me is this, is that every nation, tribe, language, and tongue will be before God. Imagine Christians having to give an account for our nation. Right? It's a scary place to be, and I just gave you my burden. You're welcome. In regards to law, we are quick to call others out or ignore other sins if we're on the conservative side of it or the liberal side of it. But yet, do we hold to the grace given to us? Do we live out genuine Christianity? In regards to temple, this idol is pretty easy to see, right? Do we treat a church service as the totality of our faith? Is the temple it, it, all that matters? Or is there a faith outside of here in your life? That it maybe as long as we, we think that as long as there's a service we attend, what else matters? And I grew up in a Christianity for decades with the mindset that as long as I attended church, I was fine. But Scripture says there's a lot more to the Christian life than where you're at on Sundays. Sometimes we can have this sacred cow of the temple. And we think as long as we're here, we're okay. I would submit to you that th these three idols before Stephen are fortunately, unfortunately alive and well today. So Stephen exposes these idols made with human hands. Stephen also mentions other Messiah figures in Israel's history. And to use Joseph and Moses as examples, I want you to see their similarities to Christ. Why does he mention these men? Joseph, for example, Joseph was beloved by his father, just like Christ. He was hated by his brothers, just like Christ. Do you see where I'm going here? He was sold for the price of a slave, 30 pieces of silver, just like Jesus, a humble servant, falsely accused. Joseph was exalted to honor, just like Jesus. Joseph took a Gentile bride. Jesus takes the church. How beautiful is that? How beautiful is that? Joseph was not recognized by his brothers the first time, but they received him the second time. More on that in a second. Look at Moses. Moses was, was persecuted, almost killed as a child. If you go to the beginning of Matthew, Herod tries to kill Jesus. Moses rejected the world to save his people. Just like Jesus, he became a shepherd. Moses also took a Gentile bride. Again, Jesus takes the church. Moses was rejected the first time by his people. He was received the second time. Moses was considered a prophet, a priest, and a king. So in both of these men, the one thing I want to talk with you real quick and we'll move on, is that they were rejected the first time, they were accepted the second time. I told you that God wasn't done with Israel yet. And so... 
even though Jesus has been rejected, what, what they say, what Zechariah says in the Old Testament, that a time will come when Jesus will be received. And I want you to see the verse. This is 1210. Um, Zechariah says, And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on him whom they pierced, they have pierced. They shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weeps bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. So just like Moses, just like Joseph, rejected the first time, received the second time. And there's going to be a time, according to to prophecy, when Jesus will be received. To be honest, in this moment, Stephen has all of them pegged and they don't like it at all. So Stephen ends his presentation as a prophet as they reject God. To his accusers, he, instead of Stephen answering for his accusation, what does he do? He accuses his accusers. Imagine doing that in court. That's pretty much a judicial suicide at that point, right? Blame the judge. Not a good move, unless you're there to glorify God, but that's another story. But to his accusers, he accuses. He uses words from Jeremiah and Ezekiel when he calls them stiff-necked people. They would be familiar with these words. These were Old Testament prophetic words. Uncircumcised hearts. Old Testament prophetic words. But here's what I want you to see here and why this passage is so important. See the fullness of their rejection of God. And we have to go back not far, but we'll see this pretty quickly and pretty easily. First and foremost, God sends John the Baptist. John is sent by the Father to call the people to himself. John the Baptist is rejected and he's killed. So the Father sends John the Baptist. God now sends his Son. And they reject the Son. And they kill the Son. What does Stephen say at the end of this, which is so important? He says, you always resist the Holy Spirit. You always resist the Holy Spirit. The whole nature of God is rejected by his people. His entire nature is rejected by them. And this generation experiences the judgment of God as the the temple is destroyed in 70 A.D., But Zechariah gives hope at the same time because God is not done with Israel. And this gives us hope because no matter how far we stray, God is not done with us. All right, last part. We got through the worst of the reading, I promise. But I got a few verses left. All right. This is 754 through 83. Now when they heard these things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him, but he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul." And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And Saul approved of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church, and entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. So what's happened here? Stephen had brought conviction upon his accusers, but conviction was not received. When someone experiences conviction of sin, they're either going to respond to it in repentance or rebellion, one or the other. And the Jewish leaders, that they're relying on their land, they're relying on law, they're relying on the temple, they're relying on these sacred cows. They choose rebellion. And so the death of Stephen now is no easy matter. 
Since no blood could be spilled on temple soil, they had to drag him to the outside city wall, which, which history records it was twice the height of a normal person. And there's a place that they would throw a person over a wall and they couldn't escape and they would stone that person to death. And, and because Stephen was young and strong, what we read here is the execut- executioners removed their garments because they knew this was going to be an undertaking. It was going to be suffering. And so more than likely, the, the, the death blow was probably a long process in this stoning as Steve is, Stephen is being hit again, rock after rock after rock. But in the midst of all of this, in, in the worst turmoil of his life, Stephen sees Jesus. Stephen sees Jesus. Stephen is given the greatest blessing by Christ at the end of his life. Stephen echoes Christ in his words. He says, don't hold this against them. He says, receive my spirit. He holds to to Christ closely in this moment. Traditionally in stoning, what would happen is is this, is that a person that was being executed was taught to confess their own sin in order that their death would atone for the sin in, in Jewish customs. But Stephen's not asking for that. He's asking for for forgiveness of their sins, of their sins, not his own. He asked God for forgiveness of their sins. Stephen confesses the sin of his accusers and he forgives them. Grace upon grace offered from a man dying at the hands of his murderers. Notice something in this passage, and a lot of people miss this. Notice that Jesus is standing at the right hand of God. You know what scripture says where he's going to be? Seated. Here's the beautiful thing of this moment. Stephen's dying. Stephen's dying. And Jesus decides to stand to receive his own. And every time I think of something like that, that it gives me chill bumps. But normally he's seated at the right hand of God. And in that moment, at the end of Stephen's life, Jesus stands. He stands. Jesus stands to welcome him home. When Stephen could have seen the angry people He could have seen the condemnation or the stones. Stephen sees Jesus. I told you at the beginning of this sermon that death will ultimately reveal who we really are. Stephen's final words reveal much of him. The question is simply this, what will be revealed with our final words? It's not too late to live out grace overflowing. It is not too late to change the kind of person you and I are. It is not too late to tell a different ending to your story, to live out the grace given to you. What is rather interesting is that the word Stephen, do you know what it means? Stephen should know. It means crown. It means crown. The difficult thing for Stephen, yet the glorious thing for Stephen, is that his master wore a crown of thorns. His master wore a crown of thorns. Scholars debate this, but it's highly possible that that Paul helped Luke write this section from the perspective of, of the church persecuting Stephen to give more insight. Paul, in his latter years, he spoke of regret in his participation in the death of Stephen. But you see this. God uses this event to shape Saul into Paul. And an instrument of sin becomes an instrument of glory through Paul's life. And if God can change Saul, he can change us if we surrender. Do you understand? Do you really understand that we are all meant to be instruments of glory? Do you understand that? Because the thing is, I think if we really understand that, We'd live differently. There are things we wouldn't spend our time on that we spend our time on. There are things that that, that we currently do that we wouldn't do if we understood that every one of us was an instrument of glory.
not our glory, his. And the challenge today is simply this, and I'm sorry for going along. Let us be instruments of glory. Let us be instruments of glory. At the end, I would rather have Stephen's ending than the, the man at the beginning of our story. We get, we get to walk this out. Will you be an instrument of glory? Will you pray with me? God, and today, which is basically the, the, the eulogy of a man named Stephen in your word, God, the challenge is to live better, to seek after you with all of our hearts, God, to understand who you really are, and, and as we learn and as we grow, God, to, to grow deeper in, in knowledge and faith and belief and action and word so that we would bring you glory. God, let us be instruments of glory for your kingdom. We are called ambassadors because we are in a different nation other than than your kingdom, and we're here to bring you glory, just like an ambassador would represent another kingdom. God, let let us be your instruments. Use us for your purposes. We love and praise you in Jesus' name. Thank you.
say our verse together. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. You guys have a great weekend. Thank you.